We're out here in the chicken yard on this crisp late fall morning and I thought there'd be an opportunity to talk about in greater detail how it is that we've gotten to a place where we have red wigglers in our front yard chicken composting system at a level where we can provide red wiggler uh, worms to our chickens pretty much every day of the year, even through the winter. So stick around, I'll share lots of notes with you. When I say red wigglers in good numbers, what I mean is something like that. Now this is a particularly rich area of them. I'm gonna go ahead and tuck them back away so the hens don't eat them all. But let's get into how we've gotten to the place where there are red wigglers literally everywhere here. We're outside of our chicken yard now. We're about, I don't know, 20 feet away or so. And we've got this secondary composting system here that a few years ago, I reached out to a friend who had an active red wiggler population growing and asked if I could get some. By all means, you can go online and purchase them, but maybe before you do that, ask local gardeners, check your own compost piles, ask around to folks that might have animals uh, on their farm or in their gardens, and can you collect their manures? A lot of times they're already there. She has goats, and we're able to get uh, red wigglers in a bucket from her, and we added them to this compost pile that's out here first. This was a few years ago, so we could tend them. This is a long game. It's like you're planting an orchard or you're doing perennial agriculture. It takes a little while before you get to a place where your hens can eat them. So we inoculated this other compost pile first. Now this is an area when we get compost that we don't want to feed directly to our chickens. So for example, let's say we get a five gallon bucket of coffee grinds. We'll add that here. Or we can get various types of animal manures and add them to this composting system and let the red wiggler population really build up. We also insulate this a little for the winter. This is optional, but if wherever you live you might be able to collect leaf bags or get free wood chips, keep it free. Keep it lofty and carbony and keep it free and think about insulating your red wiggler space if you're in a cold climate like we are. We're back in the chicken yard now. So we've got our composting system off to the side where we know we can start really helping to facilitate red wiggler populations to increase. We're keeping an eye on that. We're adding coffee grinds, we're adding manures, we're adding uh, compost from our, chick from our kitchen system that isn't really ideal for our hens. We're keeping it warm in the winter. Once it feels like the populations are starting to increase, what we then did is start bringing them in little by little into these protected contexts. So in our case, a lot of folks know we really like using milk crates. We're able to find these very inexpensively uh, locally, and they're very sturdy and rugged. And what we do is that we add red wigglers with more wood chips, with more leaves, with more coffee grinds, more feed. And in the milk crate, they're able to proliferate even further right in the chicken yard. And whatever compost is touching that on any side, they can move into it. So in other words, we're getting all of these inoculation points. And each one might only have 10 or 20 or 30 worms at first, but over time, they replicate in that space. Some stay, some venture out, and our hens get to eat those who leave. But meanwhile, we've got these nuclei, these cores that can seed back into our composting system. It's worked really nicely for us. I'm showing some examples here using milk crates. That's all well and good. Maybe you don't want to buy them. Maybe you don't have access to them or you can't find them. That's fine. Skip the milk crate. Here's another way of approaching it. These are compost rings. These are two by four inch welded wire sections of fence. Maybe somewhere around you folks have old spools of this. I know around here they do. And nice and low like this, it's easy to access. This could be hardware cloth. This could be chicken wire with some stakes but it's the same basic pattern. Having little composting areas that aren't fully exposed to the chickens being able to dig all the way down or kick it fully apart. And each of these also act like nuclei to build up worms. Now this one I just added to yesterday, uh, so it's mainly carbony. So I might grab some known worms from right nearby and spike this a little. 
fact, I'll go with two scoops and then I will add some more leaves and sticks because that's part of this too, is when you open up a composting area that has lots of red wigglers, at least in our opinion, it makes sense to let the chickens have some fun for a moment or two and then cover it again. You can add rocks and sticks, you can add cardboard, you can just add lots of leaves in the fall, but basically give them a little and then hide it again so they have to work more for it. it gives the worms a chance to hide away too and it keeps the populations ever increasing. We also can be even less formal with this process. No milk crates, no compost rings, okay. Start getting the red wiggler populations up to speed and then in your chicken yard, maybe you've got very limited access or very limited space. What about your walkways? Those can actually be places to generate huge numbers of red wigglers as well. This area as we first come in is where we'll take wheelbarrow loads of weeds from the garden for our chickens to eat. We'll add leaf bags in the fall wood chips, we're always adding more carbon. We're piling it up and letting the chickens kick it apart. And you can see it's complex and stringy in here. Weeds and roots. There's soil in here. There's leaves. Now this area doesn't have red wigglers yet. This was only added to maybe two or three days ago. But they'll be able to migrate up and into this. You can see a little further down way more red wigglers. They're working on the walnut husks that we dumped in here a few weeks ago. So even our walkways that we all walk on and access this space through can be used to support the growth of red wigglers. If it gets too mushy and sloppy, fine. Add deep layers of wood chips on top. It gives you better traction, better drainage in the walkway, allows the red wigglers to keep growing. Um, and it works pretty nicely. You can see everywhere in here is lumpy and is actively farming red wigglers, actively gardening them. We use this main walkway 10, 15 times a day. So what we end up doing is the parts we walk on, we scrape that material and send it off to the side. And throughout the day, the hens will kick that back down. This is a more active, nearly daily micro compost turning operation. But in the center of this pile, which they haven't fully kicked apart, you can imagine there are huge numbers of red wigglers. And as we tumble that down, they'll access it little by little. You can also see they're actively working on soaked grain all through here, which will sprout and feed both the hens directly and the red wigglers. And that just happens spontaneously and naturally. I think with composting, a lot of times it can be tempting to get the compost as hot as you possibly can. I know when we first started, I was always testing the temperature. I wanted to see how hot can we get it. It was almost competitive. With worms, and I think in general with healthy compost, it's not about screaming hot, absolutely rapid composting. I think you volatilize a lot of nutrients uh, and worms can't live in there. Fungi can't really thrive in there. You can see in our first bay of our incoming food scraps, it gets so hot just because of how much nutrient is coming in that it's actually pretty darn steamy. And that's all well and good for a few days to help the food scraps start to really break down. But if we were aiming for this level of heat all the time, the red wigglers would not be able to have a great time in there. So as it gets much more cold, it's good to know how to get a compost pile warm or hot just to get it thawed out again. But there are some red wigglers in here, but they're not loving it. Their preference is imagine a piping hot day in the summer, in the 80s or 90s. That's their sweet spot. But much above that, they have a hard time. I think you'll notice as a theme here, what I'm trying to avoid is to give exacting scientific based things. Like what is the perfect pH? What is this or that? There's sweet spots with this. If you smell a sourness, something's a little bit off. You either need to turn the compost and wake it up or you need to add a little bit of carbon. Almost always when in doubt, turn it a bit gently, add more carbon if things feel off. Um, but we don't need to know the exact pH. We don't need to, we don't go in with a temperature probe. We want it to feel warm to the hand on a cool day. 
and in the summer when it's hot out we don't want to feel heat we want it to be about the temperature of the day outside so use your intuition and empirically you'll understand what needs to happen um, you'll see here right next to that first bay it's a lot more mellowed it's gotten a lot more balanced we keep adding sawdust and wood chips and a little bit of leaves and the red wigglers can enter back in. Right here is an incredibly sweet spot. So I'm gonna sneak that away from the hens before they eat every last bit and add it to the edge of the hot bay and put a little leaves on top. Inoculate the margin or the edge so they can move into that as it cools off. The most important thing I want people to take away from this video is that you can do this. We do not have any formal training. I think that's quite obvious at this point. But when you get into it and you start paying attention to what the living beings are you're working with, when do they seem to thrive? When do they seem to go away? What seems to improve their overall living conditions so that they can replicate? Can really start to garden with these creatures and have them integrate into our composting system providing our hens immensely valuable food, making beautiful soil, and adding more complexity and resilience to the living systems that grow around you. Thanks for watching. Ha <laughs> ha